Good morning. I'm Andrew Lansley. I'm Strategic Counsel at Low Associates, and it is our very great pleasure and privilege at Low Associates to be supporting DG Regio and the Border Focal Point Network, bringing peoples of Europe closer together, living labs of European integration in cross-border regions. This is our 19th uh, Beyond Borders breakfast debate, uh, and this morning we're looking at the most interesting uh, subject of how to improve uh, public transport options for those who are frequent uh, and indeed commuting travellers uh, in our cross-border regions, where sometimes the public transport options may be limited and uh, they are resorting to private vehicles when they would prefer to have public transport options. And we have a very distinguished and expert panel uh, of those who have expertise and experience uh, in providing solutions to these issues. Uh, the format of our debate this morning uh, will be that uh, we will have an introduction, a video testimonial from uh, our Youth for Cooperation ambassadors and a panel discussion. There is, as always with our breakfast debates, opportunities for all of our participants who are very welcome indeed to themselves to contribute to the debate. There will be two such opportunities today. One is through the chat function. Do please put up on the chat questions for our panelists, uh, ideas and responses to some of the uh, issues that are being raised. And very often it is used very helpfully to put up links and references that all of our colleagues can use to find uh, access to the materials that are mentioned. Also, uh, during the course of our debate, two, there will be two opportunities for uh, all of us to respond to a poll, to give your opinions about the issues that are being raised in our debate this morning. Uh, and I will launch the first of those polls now. And the question that we are going to be asking is, how can commuters be encouraged to use cross-border public transport of private vehicles? OK, let me just repeat that. How can commuters be encouraged to use cross-border public transport instead of private vehicles? Uh, and uh, please, when you are responding to the poll uh, through the, um, I think it's through the chat function, uh, when you're doing that, you can see there are a number of options. Uh, offering financial incentives, ensuring reliable and frequent services, implementing unified ticketing systems, harmonising time schedules between uh, service providers and implementing strict regulations on private vehicle use. And indeed, if you have other um, uh, solutions to this question, you have an opportunity to write them in. And I can see our colleagues are responding to that already. But to take us into our debate proper, uh, I'm delighted to introduce Marlies Peters from DG Regio. Uh, who in DG Regio uh, understands very well some of the obstacles that we face, uh, but also some of the benefits. And Malis, I wonder if you could introduce particularly what are some of the benefits of improving these cross-border transport options, public transport options might be in our debate today. Malis, please. Uh, good morning, uh, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this Beyond Borders breakfast debate uh, in the next hour. We will explore ways to boost cross-border public transport and to stimulate the debate on accessibility in uh, cross-border regions. Uh, the quality of many citizens living in border regions could be improved with better quality and more frequent cross-border public transport connections. As for many of these citizens, the catchment area for everyday life activities reaches across national borders. The challenges to good quality cross-border connections are numerous. Networks and services need to be jointly planned. Legal obstacles need to be overcome. We know that transport is one of the three most common cross-border obstacles. The two others are employment labor market and healthcare. DG Regio has produced knowledge and conducted several studies on cross-border transport. 
the most recent on today's topic is the study on providing public transport in cross-border regions published in 2022. And the study presents an inventory of cross-border public transport routes and services, analyzes obstacles and solutions, and illustrates these obstacles and solutions more in depth in 31 case studies. And it also includes a toolbox with guidance for, for stakeholders. So I will put uh, later on the link to the study in the chat. Uh, TG Regio is also pushing for solutions to overcome cross-border obstacles, cross-border transport obstacles. So the first instrument is P Solutions and provides expertise to identify precisely what obstacles are and recommend the actions to be done to reduce or overcome them. For example, to integrate public transport systems. And the second one is funding under the Interreg programs with a dedicated specific objective on reducing legal and administrative obstacles, allowing authorities and stakeholders to work on these. The third instrument we provide for solutions is the legal proposal called facilitating cross-border solutions. And this proposal would simplify finding solutions for border obstacles, also for cross-border transport obstacles. The proposal is now under discussion in the legislative process. So I would like to invite all stakeholders today to get involved in these instruments and to work on solutions for, for cross-border transport, as it will benefit, benefit all the citizens in the cross-border regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Molly, and thank you for that invitation to stakeholders to, to get involved. And as we've discovered in our breakfast debates on frequent occasions, B Solutions is an increasingly um, valuable instrument in dealing with the uh, challenges and obstacles that we may face. Um, we have, uh, as many of those uh, involved in the focal point, border focal point network will recall, in recent months had the benefit of youth for cooperation cross-border ambassadors young people with experience and knowledge of cross-border regions telling us about their experiences. And we have a testimonial today from two of our ambassadors, Enoch and Simon, but they will explain for themselves. So let us listen and see what our ambassadors have to say about public transport in their cross-border regions, please. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nino Polissen. I come from Lille in the north of France. In my region, the cross-border public transport offer is far from being optimal, especially when it comes to bus lines, as there are only a few that actually do not stop at the border. There is also a high diversity of cross-border public transport actors. Um, and one of the main challenges is therefore to coordinate the actions of all of these actors. Intense cooperation efforts between France and Belgium are crucial to address these challenges. I really believe that we need common cross-border strategies to integrate domestic public transport services. Improved cross-border public transport would not only facilitate access to new and more employment opportunities, but it would also foster economic growth, tourism and cultural exchanges. It would also help reducing the reliance on private vehicles, which currently remain the privileged mode of transportation. My name is Sima Jekkes, I'm from Sweden. I have traveled a lot in the Finnish Swedish border region, which is a sparsely populated region in Northern Europe. In Sweden, the bus transportation is more oriented towards cross-municipal travel and in Finland is more oriented on long-distance traveling. And because of this, I found it quite hard to visit relatives in, in Northern Finland. And because of this, I would like to implement an idea that is common public transportation networks, in this case, busing, that would be common across the borders with common timetables and common bus routes that go across the borders. I believe this would be more, make it more convenient for tourists, or mainly for people living in border regions, especially young people, so they don't feel they have need to uh, relocate to larger cities and can stay in the regions where they came from.
Well, we're very grateful to our two ambassadors for uh, sharing their views, which I thought actually captured exactly the issues that we're hoping to examine today. Um, and let's come into our panel discussion by uh, introducing, if I may introduce, please, Hannah Kroll, who is project manager at the Aachen Transport Association. Uh, Hannah, you listened to our testimonial, no doubt, these are very familiar problems that are being discussed, but in very different places. One in a what is a relatively um, highly populated area, another in a very rural area. But you have one of those very um, important and highly populated areas. Hannah, could you please very kindly tell us something about the, the conditions in your region that have led to the solutions that you've been working on, including the EU Regio ticket? Yes. Good morning, Hannah. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, for introducing me as um, yeah, as the speaker from um, our Aachen region. And thank you for this initiative. I have to say it's uh, really great to see how many of you are interested to um, to share your views and to listen to <laughs> to ideas. And also, um, I think it's a very nice mix of perspectives. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so I'm, let me just quickly introduce myself. I'm Hannah Kroll from um, Aachen Transport Association, as Andrew just mentioned. Um, I work together with my colleague Dominic Elsmann um, in the Department for Cross-Border Public Transport. And um, this is just my... <laughs> my uh, overview slide to show you an example of uh, yeah what things that are very common to us now. I will show you a map also of a region in a minute. And here you see a typical bus from Aachen um, offered by the Aachen public transport operator um, stopping at a Belgian bus stop. So we are really very, very close to um, the Belgian and the Dutch border. Um, next slide, please. So you can have a quick look at uh, where we are. In Europe, I mean, um, just so you know, it's really this triangle situation that we have. It's very nice and very challenging at the same time. So we are um, in Aachen and then right next to Belgium and the Netherlands. And then, of course, in Belgium, we have different regions as well. So it's a lot of different perspectives and political uh, situations and priorities we have to keep in mind. And of course, um, as well for tourists as for employees and students it's it's very challenging to use public transport and very tempting to use the car instead when you have um yeah the extra mile so to say of of um crossing the border or by bus or by train uh, next slide please Thank you. So we've heard a little bit of it already this morning, um, so I won't go into it too much, but this is just an example of the challenges we all face. Um, different responsibilities, different structures of decision making, different habits. In Germany, a lot of people this morning, I saw it in the bakery, everyone loves to pay in cash and co count coins. In the Netherlands, no one does that anymore. Everyone just uses the card, uh, similar in Belgium. So a lot of challenges we're facing and a lot of challenges more than in, in one region or one country. So um, why we're here today, of course, to discuss how to dismantle these barriers together. Next slide, please. Um, so we are the Department of cross border Public Transport, and it's really one of the initiatives, actually, Andrew, that um, yeah we, we've taken is to set up this department in the first place. It's been there for 20 years. It was a result of um, an early Interreg project, um, and it's yeah we're basically the the single point of contact for the whole region. So we try to. Um, build these networks that you were mentioning earlier to um, make sure the actors speak to each other before they make decisions. Like, and the ambassador was also mentioning very close cooperation is crucial. So we're working with transport operators in the region, um, with the regional actors um, on also employment, all kinds of different issues that are responsible. And of course, with local authorities who are um, in close contact to the citizens. And we work on the acquisition and implementation of EU funded projects um, on marketing and passenger information, cross-border infrastructure and services, and of course, cross-border tariffs and ticketing. And um, we're doing this to improve cross-border public transport. So that's who we are. Next slide, please. 
So some of the initiatives I've, um, I thought about, I think it's good to distinguish between um, governance and technological ideas and progress because it's really also a lot about communication and networking and trust. So a lot of working groups are in place that we really um, try to, for example, we have a big group of actors that meets four times a year at the moment online, but just to make sure we share ideas and plans on, um, like you say, scheduling, tariffing before decisions are made and just to make sure they are adjusted and that the one bus doesn't leave yeah, one minute before the other arrives. You have to wait for an hour. So really just very, very close working groups. Capacity building is very important, like today, like at conferences or um, even interact projects that are there to share um, experiences across border regions in the whole of Europe. So um, we are also investing in that. And of course, um, acquiring public funding to enhance network building and regional commitment and really to be able to invest in innovation. Um, and you know the projects that are there. We've been trying to make use of those. And um, technological pro progress, for example, interoper interoperable e-ticketing, I will show you a little bit in a minute. Um, we have been able to integrate real-time data on um, time schedules. So in Aachen, at the bus stop, we can see in real time whether the Belgian and Dutch buses are on time or not, which is very complicated technically. So it's it's taken a long time, but it's there now and it's a great help. Um, and we have been able to extend the student ticket that German students use here for public transport. They can also use it in the south of the Netherlands now, which is also takes a lot of negotiation, but it's a huge uh, advantage for living, working and studying in the region. And we have also expanded a bike rental scheme um, from Aachen to the Netherlands. Yes, next slide. I think I have to skip a little bit the time. Um, line because it's um, running out of time <laughs> but just so you see how long it's been and that it's really a step-by-step -step thing different interact projects and um, please continue to the next one i'm afraid it's, it's a little bit too much <laughs> i'm sorry about that but maybe the shared slides will be shared and you can also get in touch with me later on so this is um yeah, just a timeline of what has been happening um yeah, the student ticket was quite recent and the Origio ticket, we also um, made sure that it's possible to use that with a bicycle. Next slide, please. And there's more. <laughs> OK, one more. Please, next slide. Yes. Um, so one of the examples Andrew mentioned is the Origio ticket. It's been around for more than 20 years, even before our department was put in place. And it's quite unique in Europe. So it's um, it's a ticket you can buy in the whole region and it's valid for the entire day on public transport. And at the weekend, we can also take along an adult and children. So it's very attractive and it's very popular. Last year, 22,000 was sold. Um, it's almost the pre-COVID level that we've reached again, luckily. And at the moment, it costs €21.70 to use in the whole region. Uh, next slide, please. And just um, so to show you the next step, I mean, Origio ticket is more of a single solution for, yeah, just for the region itself. Now with e-ticketing, we are trying to go the next step and to um, to combine local tariffs with each other in e-ticketing. So that's a project we're working on at the moment. We are getting funding from um, Northern Westphalia and the Dutch partners are getting funding from the Dutch ministry. So we're just working hand in hand to make sure it's coherent and um, we're hoping to go live this summer with so that you can check in in one country, check out in the other country, just use one app and one account. So that's our goal. So we, we keep going forward, <laughs> but it's a long way, as you all know. So this is our goal for for the summer. Yes. Thank no, you very thank much you. for listening. And um, yeah, happy to. Anna, thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely terrific um, description of such a wide range of uh, important initiatives. And the link between the governance and the projects, I think, is very important and the deployment of uh, some of the funding opportunities, including from Interreg, very useful. But Hannah, before we just move on, can I just ask one question? Mm -hmm. um, 
obviously the EU Regio ticket you described is often used on a one-off, uh, you know, for, for a family, for example, for the day or somebody who needs it that day. But what impact are the initiatives having on uh, really frequent travellers, the commuters, people who are working uh, and crossing the border every day? Are they, are they shifting uh, as these initiatives have come through? Are they moving from their private vehicles into new public transport options? Um, I'm afraid not so much. I'm afraid it's rather um, not not the biggest target group, so to say. They're trying to use local subscriptions and combine them with each other, with each other, with each other but it's not attractive because you're always only using a small section of that subscription. So that is something we're working on and because there are corporate mobility projects um, in every region. So we're trying to, but it's a very big legal challenge to, uh, for example, help companies and consult companies in um, incentivizing their employees if they use, um, if they drive together with other colleagues or if they use the bus to have certain um, yeah, financial incentives or um, Maybe if you, if you share a ride, you can maybe um, have advantage in parking, for example. These things are in yeah. place in one region. So I think that is something that would really help also for commuters and everyday traffic. And, 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 the, com and the companies, in uh, the employers themselves, are actively engaged now in trying to move people away from using their cars, their personal vehicles for their commute. I know they are, for example, within Aachen region and in Maastricht, they are um, very success, success, successful with that. Sorry, talking too fast. Um, but I think they are just afraid of the legal challenges. So whenever they have an employee living in the other country, they don't really know what to offer or what to suggest. Right. And that's so, where B solutions might be one of the um, uh, opportunities for dealing with that, might it not? I think so, actually. I have to look into that. Yes, I heard about it already in October at a conference, and I think that would be a really great um, idea to to try that out. Yes. Hannah, thank you very much. Stay with us uh, because we'll come to the panel discussion and there will be no doubt other questions from our uh, audience this morning. Uh, speaking of thank our you. audience, they have very kindly um, responded to the first poll uh, in a very decisive manner. There are one uh, uh, of our responses, overwhelmingly, they are saying that they are looking for ensuring reliable and frequent services. This is one of those I know uh, where transport is concerned. If you can, if you can make it so that people know, literally, they walk to a bus stop, and the bus will arrive within a short period of time and is reliably to be available, then people will use it. So that is a central question. You did mention. Hannah, unified ticketing systems and harmonising time schedules, and that uh, does get a number of responses, positive responses, as well as financial incentives. Uh, it looks, Hannah, like you and your colleagues uh, in in your um, cross-border transport activity, are you're, you're literally ticking all these boxes of things that could be done. So uh, thank you very much indeed for your contribution. May I move on, however, <laughs> to launch our second poll? Uh, the question that we are ans asking in our second poll uh, to all of our participants is what is preventing more and better cross-border public transport services? And there are a range of options for this. That is legal and or administrative barriers impeding their establishment, lack of political will, variations in ticketing methods or prices, infrequent service schedules or language barriers. And again, if those are not of the um, um, obstacles that you perceive, you can write other options in uh, to the poll. So those are the five options. I think you can choose two of those if you wish, uh, and we'll look at the responses to that poll a little bit later on. Uh, in the meantime, I'm very much uh, um, pleased to be introducing Paolo Delano, is uh, the uh, Interreg Central Europe project manager at Connect2CE. So, uh, Paolo, now you have a number of projects, past projects. Uh, you, thank you, your slide helps me. Connect2CE and Sustance, I think 
that the, the first is a previous project, uh, the latter is a new project. Could you tell us something about how those uh, results, the results of those projects and the opportunities those projects might bring in your region? Thank you very much, Andrew. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the floor. It's a great opportunity to present you some of the results we have achieved in the framework of uh, these two projects. I would like just to mention that I'm project manager at the Central European Initiative Executive Secretariat, which is an international organization based in Trieste, embracing 17 member states of Central, Eastern and Southern Europe, and with the scope of promoting integration and dialogue. So the connect to see project was funded by the Interreg Central Europe program, as you correctly said in the previous programming period, and it's aimed at uh, solving uh, the existing public transport obstacles in some selected cross border region by designing on one side new public transport services and on the other side by improving the accessibility of the existing uh, services through ICT tools. In this regard, today I'm pleased to present you the results of one of these pilot actions of connect to sea project aimed to facilitate intermodal travel between Trieste in Italy and Ljubljana in Slovenia by introducing a single ticket covering both the bus, the bus and the train journeys. Next slide, please. So more particularly, the connect to sea integrated ticket allowed passengers to travel from Trieste city center to the border railway station of Trieste Villa Piccina by using the regular urban bus service operated by the public transport operator and then continuing the trip with the same ticket by catching the train from Trieste Villa Piccina to Ljubljana. This experimental project faced several major challenges at the time. First of all, the lack of total cross-border public transport connections between Italy and Slovenia at the time of the pilot, we speak about 2017. Then the lack of accessibility by bus to the train station due to the very bad condition of the road to reach the station. Not harmonized timetables between train and bus services and Last but not least, the complexity is caused by different ticketing and payment systems. So, first of all, we reached an agreement that was signed by the regional bus operator Trieste Transport and the Slovenian Railways. Um, the integrated ticket was then developed as a new ticketing application combining the two services into a single e-ticket. In addition, thanks to the cooperation of different institutions, the pilot action also activated additional investments to solve the issues related to road accessibility by bus of the train station. So despite the integrated bus train ticket was operated only for one year uh, as an experimental service within the project, long-term results have been achieved as the extraordinary road maintenance of the uh, allowed the stable reactivation of the bus service at Villa Piccina railway station. So providing commuters and cross-border passengers with new sustainable and seamless solutions to travel between Italy and Slovenia. Then an agreement, as we can see here, was signed in order to share tariffs and ticketing schemes for improving cross-border mobility. And we also managed to harmonize timetables between train service and bus services. Basically, promotion, promoting cooperation between tra public transport operators in Slovenia and Italy. So, slide three and four. So, the next slides will show you the situation before the pilot action. So, with the problems I mentioned regarding the lack of bus services at the station and the lack of accessibility. And in the next slide, thanks to the cooperation with all the stakeholders that are listed in this slide, you can see the results we have achieved in terms of improved accessibility. So in conclusion, the pilot action has not only delivered a tangible improvement in public transport accessibility, but, but has also supported a spirit of cooperation that was the basis for the promotion of other initiatives on the improvement of cross-border public transport. So this gives me the opportunity to introduce the other projects, so the ongoing project sustance, also led by the Central European Initiative. So the positive results we have achieved within connect to c uh, was the basis for this project that focused on improving public transport connection between cross-border areas and the main urban areas in uh, Central Europe. This is a project also funded by the Interest Central Europe uh, program that while posing attention to uh, promoting cross-border public transport rail services also pays particular emphasis 
to improving the accessibility of sustainable multimodal transport solution as the combination of bus and train. Next slide, please. So in this regard, I'd like to mention an ongoing sustenance pilot action. So an, an experimental direct train service that after 50 years connected again uh, by public transport, the cities in, of Rijeka in Croatia with Trieste Villa Piccina in Italy via Slovenia, activated thanks to the cooperation with Slovenian railways and Croatian railways. So considering railways as a backbone for cross-border public transport mobility, the Sustans project launched this experimental service uh, on April this year. Next slide, please. So in order to improve transport accessibility to the train station of Villa Piccina, based on the results achieved within the Connect to Sea project, in cooperation with the Friuli Venezia Giulia region and the urban bus operator, the harmonization of timetables between bus and train was guaranteed and allowed enhanced public transport accessibility to the border station. Therefore, despite the previous integrated ticketing pilot action of Connect to Sea has only been an experimental temporary service, the results and the level of cooperation achieved among transport operators across the borders was of utmost importance to promote long-term mobility services as happening now within Sustance project. So this is basically the, uh, the situation uh, now, and uh, we look forward to the good results on, uh, from passengers. Thank you. Paolo, thank you very much indeed. And uh, that's it, fascinating to see um, what an improvement in service that has been able to uh, offer to your travellers. Uh, and also, as far as I could see in that picture, there was some really unusual in-service entertainment being offered on at least one of those services. <laughs> yes, this was the experimental, uh, the first day of the launch. So we celebrated it with uh, some amenities on board. Music and, and was... dance. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never on the never on the trains that I'm on. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Paolo. Um, uh, if I may, we'll come uh, back during the uh, panel discussion with additional points, if I may. But I did want to take now the uh, results of our second poll. Um, the um, uh, our colleagues have been responding, and there we are. We can see that, uh, in particular, they have been. Uh, thinking that it is legal and administrative barriers that are impeding the establishment of better cross-border public transport services. And then secondarily, um, but also in a many instances, lack of political will. Now, there are practical problems that people refer to, um, like variations in ticketing methods and infrequent service schedules, but not many. Um, most people are focusing on those two things, the administrative barriers or legal barriers, and the lack of political will, of course, lack of political will may also be linked to the question of um, uh, the demand uh, and articulation of that demand and data on that demand. And I noted that in the chat, Stephen uh, made the point that uh, one of the um, uh, barriers might be the lack of data on demand for cross-border public transport services. So, uh, of course, that data, if increased data is available, may also stimulate greater political, uh, positive political responses. So those are the results of the second poll, which uh, I will ask our panelists to comment on in a short while. But I have two further distinguished panelists to introduce. Let me come now, if I may, to uh, Marcin Wojcik, who is a uh, policy officer at DG Move uh, and uh, directly involved in many of these issues. Uh, Martin, can you you you've seen what uh, our audience, our participants have told us about some of the barriers and of course administrative and legal uh, obstacles feature there. I wonder if perhaps you could tell us something about um, what you have identified and indeed some of the solutions that you are working on. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Andrew, and good morning, uh, everybody. I'm really glad to be here today and uh, thank you for having me here. At uh, today event uh, links to, to my previous experience because some 15 years ago I used to work at the DG uh, Regio uh, and I was involved in cross-border cooperation. For the last nine years uh, I'm at uh, DG uh, MOVE and uh, dealing with a number of issues including uh, creation of a single uh, rail area and uh, 
getting rid of uh, different national uh, rules, uh, introduction of the single uh, uh, system for railways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So at this moment, I'm dealing with uh, infrastructure, and more precisely, I'm in charge of the TNT regulation. So I will maybe start my intervention from the infrastructure angle. And it's uh, roughly obvious for everyone that if uh, there is no infrastructure, there are no cross-border flows. And we still experience in Europe a situation that there are on some borders less bridges on the borders than uh, before the Second World War. So it definitely inhibits uh, the cooperation and, uh, and number of commuters who are trying to find job uh, across uh, the border. So from this perspective, uh, having infrastructure is uh, vital. And in the revised entity regulation, that by the way should uh, be published uh, tomorrow, we are coming up with a number, an array of uh, infrastructure standards that uh, member states will have to implement uh, on the TNT network, different parts by 2030, 2040 and 2050 on the core, extended core and comprehensive network uh, respectively. So infrastructure is important, but it's also very important whether it's interoperable and how it's used. And as regards railways, uh, it seems that over the last 200 years, infrastructure managers have been making an inconceivable effort to render the railways as little interoperable as possible. So as a result, on different borders, uh, we have, for example, a different track gauge, which inhibits uh, crossing the border. We have different signaling systems, and I'm sure that um, Hannah can tell us more about her ordeals with introduction of the three uh, countries' uh, trains yes. or voltage uh, systems and the myriad of uh, technical rules. And as regards technical rules, we can be proud because over the last couple of years, we managed to weed out almost 15,000 national technical rules that uh, existed in, in Europe, and we reduce it to less than 1,000, but still those several hundred of national technical rules impede interoperability in Europe. So we have to go a step further and get rid of those national rules as well, because otherwise it's not possible to operate freely in Europe. Well, so it's uh, still a common practice that uh, cross-border trains uh, stop at the border because we have to uh, exchange locomotives as they don't have the, signal, the right signaling system on board or the drivers uh, have to be uh, replaced because they don't master the right uh, language. We are dealing with this, and uh, I'm also proud that we managed to introduce in the revised NT regulation an obligation to decommission Class B systems, meaning the national old system that are not interoperable, at least on the TNT network, uh, in the years uh, to come, and to deploy one single European uh, system it will have a tremendous effect on interoperability in Europe and also on creation a bigger market. Because at this moment, we have also a situation that uh, the locomotives can operate only in so-called area of use and uh, they cannot operate freely across uh, Europe. So they have to be uh, allowed by law to operate in other parts. And in some cases, the incumbent uh, infrastructure uh, railway undertakings prefer to scrap old rolling stock than to sell them to newcomers just to prevent any competition. As regards the language issue, we are also working on this, but we are not in the situation like, for example, in the um, road uh, uh, transport mode that the train, uh, the, the bus or uh, uh, or a lorry driver can cross the whole Europe without speaking any other language than his uh, or her mother tongue. Uh, but the train drivers have to be true polyglots and they have to master all the languages on the areas where they operate. Uh, 
and this is not uh, possible at, at this moment to make sure that uh, it works uh, correctly. So possibly artificial intelligence might help us unless we agree on one single uh, language uh, in this transport mode as we have for example the case of aviation. So we, I have never heard about uh, stopping uh, a plane uh, on the border just because the, uh, the pilot does not speak uh, uh, another language of the area uh, where uh, it's supposed to land. So it does not exist. But in the railway uh, transport mode, we still face this uh, situation. Well, uh, then market liberalization. And uh, so liberalization should provide us with more, better, cheaper uh, services. And uh, we have already this situation in the bus and coach uh, um, part of the transport. And we can see that there are many more operators who are providing uh, better quality than uh, 10 or 15 years uh, ago. But uh, the rail market is more complicated, so we're working on this. And uh, we have already um, milestones uh, set, and uh, it will uh, come uh, sooner or uh, later. What is of uh, major importance is uh, to have the reliable connections across border at uh, regular intervals. So it's uh, not possible to convince uh, people to abandon their cars and uh, and embrace uh, public transport if there are for example two connections in the morning and one connection in the afternoon because they might get to to job uh, across the border but they will not be able to to return so this regularity of connections is of major importance and uh, even here the liberalization might not make miracles because uh, Private uh, operators uh, might be interested in cherry picking and uh, it's uh, their right uh, to operate only those connections where there is a business case, but uh, not necessarily all the connections. And uh, the solution might be public service obligations. So we have also uh, European legislation as regards uh, public service obligation and how uh, the competent authorities might uh, do this because at the end of the day, somebody has to pay the bill. So whether it's the customer or it's the, the public authority, uh, especially for those connections which are not uh, profitable, but which are important for as a public good. So these regular connections are of uh, key importance to convince people to leave the cars at home or not invest in the in the cars at all. And uh, in many cases, uh, we are still uh, light years uh, from this perspective, even in those regions which are densely populated, because the, the number of people living in the border area is key for rendering uh, connections uh, profitable. So if we don't have uh, enough uh, population living in the border area, it will be extremely difficult to provide uh, public uh, connections uh, which are uh, of uh, sufficient quality. And then which was also uh, mentioned in, in the previous intervention is uh, the possibility to buy a ticket. So the customer should have the possibility to buy a ticket, which should be a through ticket, not a collection of uh, three or four tickets. And also with a uh, a sort of guarantee that uh, if he or she misses the connection, there will be another connection available, also provided by another uh, operator. And this uh, connection should cover different legs of the journey, different transport modes, and uh, on both sides or three sides of the uh, of the border. And uh, this is a, a major challenge, especially again in the railway sector, because uh, uh, the incumbent operators are not interested in sharing data, because data is a sort of a new petrol, and losing the, the control of data means uh, uh, undermining the current business model and allowing uh, newcomers, which uh, might uh, challenge their position on the market. So from uh, this perspective, uh, uh, access to data is of prime importance also for uh, having more operators 
and also having platforms selling those uh, through tickets. And possibly without uh, legal intervention, it's not possible. So just leaving it to the forces of nature, it will not happen. So we try to do this. We, we tried also to convince uh, uh, operators and rail undertakings uh, that they um, or organize themselves, but uh, there is a fierce resistance. So, so it seems that there is a clear need for European solution and uh, not necessarily just uh, those uh, bottom up uh, sol uh, approaches as, as we heard today, but uh, a general framework allowing and enforcing uh, uh, access to data and uh, an obligation also to sell any ticket to, to anybody and not just uh, to uh, in the inner circle of trust. Uh, so maybe I will stop here and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Marcin, thank you very much indeed uh, uh, for that um, re really helpful uh, description of the many uh, policy instruments that uh, you're able to deploy and perhaps in future more uh, of those will be available to you. Um, can I just make sure that we bring in our, our fourth distinguished panellist, uh, Sandra Sordini, who is the Director of the Office for International Relations at Friulia Venezia Giulia region. Uh, can you tell us, um, Sandra, if you would be kind enough to tell us a bit more about how we might convince cross-border commuters to choose public transport options. Um, I think you have uh, a, an area where there are many such commuters travelling over borders. Perhaps you could tell us something about your experience, please. Thanks a lot and uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, thanks also for organizing this very fruitful breakfast, uh, 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 breakfast, uh, let's say, uh, uh, moment <laughs> of, uh, yeah, breakfast moment to, to, to dialogue with the territories. Well, um, what to say? First of all, Friuli Venezia Giulia, where is located? Friuli Venezia Giulia is located on the northeastern part of Italy. We have a border with Slovenia on the eastern part, Austria on the northern part. Then we have the sea on the southern part and Veneto region on the western part. This means that uh, we are at the end of everything in regard to Italy, but in the middle of uh, Europe, uh, if we say and if we see where we are uh, located. Um, in uh, uh, the past years, uh, we, thanks also to Interreg, we organized uh, a lot uh, of uh, experiences uh, in cross-border uh, transportation. Um, having not a lot of time, I just uh, would like to remind that uh, just in the, the beginning of uh, the year 2000, we had uh, a very important uh, uh, result uh, with the train between uh, Udine and uh, Villac that is called Micotra, between uh, cross border between uh, Italy, uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia, and uh, uh, Villac, uh, let's uh, say, um, uh, the land of uh, Carinthia. And uh, what is important uh, to say uh, that uh, now this uh, is a stable connection. So the first thing is that uh, many, many, uh, many, many, um, let's say, experiences were, were done by Friuli Venezia Giulia region. Um, but uh, uh, it is difficult then to uh, let uh, this uh, experience uh, as a stable cross-border public uh, uh, services. Um, Mikotra is still alive and uh, it is not only alive from Udine until Villac, but uh, from Trieste until uh, um, uh, the, the land uh, Carinzia, also in connection uh, with uh, Salzburg, uh, Vienna and Munich. So this is a great result we had in the past, uh, but uh, I have to be true, it is simpler to activate, uh, um, on our opinion, uh, the um, uh, transpo tra public transport uh, uh, on uh, railway, more difficult uh, public 
transport on bus. Uh, then I explain why. Um, to the first thing uh, uh, that uh, I would like to underline to uh, uh, to to uh, to, to uh, convince uh, uh, commuters to choose uh, public transport uh, is uh, to understand very well uh, the uh, demand. And to understand very well the demand, we need to understand, of course, and we need to, to know and to have data and cross-border data regarding uh, uh, the, the number of, pass of, of people that pass uh, the, the border or commuters uh, or uh, students uh, or a tourist uh, is not so simple to have. So, to start reasoning, uh, to have uh, uh, public transportation is very, very important to have uh, data in order to uh, tailor-made the transport uh, on the uh, real demand uh, that, that, that there is. This is the first uh, step. The second step uh, is to um to create uh, as i uh, heard also um, from the previous uh, uh, speakers uh, to create uh, um, a working group uh, between all the stakeholders so not only the public authorities uh, but uh, also the uh, the um, transport uh, uh, transport uh, companies uh, and of course uh, who has uh, the, uh, the, the, the power to authorize. So you have to be very careful in order to um, create and uh, have a real and an important group engaged on a dialogue that is a multi-level dialogue between state, regions, public transport companies, and uh, uh, only if you have these two, in my opinion, um, priorities, uh, let's say, understand the demand and, and, and create uh, the conditions uh, to have all the stakeholders uh, together uh, seated on a table, it is possible to uh, create uh, a real uh, useful, cross-border transport uh, uh, service and, uh, um, and only in this way it is possible also to let uh, people choose uh, public transport uh, over personal vehicles. Super, thank you very much Sandra, that's really interesting and very clear. Thank you very much indeed for the, those uh, insights. Uh, can I um, uh, take back to you, Marcin, if I may, um, exactly that question about which is reflected also in the uh, chat comments uh, about access to data uh, and the point that uh, I think Ricardo is making in the chat, which is, uh, would it be possible for EU regulations to include an obligation on operators and infrastructure providers to share data with their public institutions for public purposes about uh, uh, demand and availability and take up of services? Well, I, I think that we should also differentiate between uh, different elements because uh, what does it mean uh, a demand? Demand does it mean that uh, what we identify as a demand in the in the region or access to data, for example, uh, which uh, tickets are available, at what price, and uh, whether there are delays, and uh, whether we can sell it through ticket or we, we cannot sell it through ticket because uh, we cannot uh, uh, connect uh, to the next uh, uh, connection uh, or next train or bus, and who is going to pay the price if there are delays, because there are many, many, many questions, many, many problems, especially in uh, in the legal system that covers not one member state but several member states, which this creates a lot of problems. So maybe if you could maybe uh, clarify this question, and I will uh, maybe yeah. uh, well, go into uh, details. 
let, let's look at a particular instance. Hannah, let, if I may bring you back in. Uh, one of the things we were talking about was the extent to which commuters are using private vehicles, not using public transport options. Um, we're having this discussion about the data. Clearly, this is, this is the, the, the train and bus operators don't necessarily have data about how many commuters are using their private vehicles. So to that extent, this is potential demand for their services, but they may not necessarily know about it. Do with your through your governance, do you have mechanisms for trying to understand what the, uh, as it were, unsatisfied demand might be? People who are commuting who perhaps would have a better option used in public transport, but they don't feel it's reliable or frequent enough. Um, I think so. I'm not sure if you're referring now to the availability of data or the reasons why um, well, they not both both really. Both, I, yes. I, I okay. Think, I think yeah. uh, to send it's yes the data, but mm -hmm. also of course the interpretation of the data. What does that mean? Would would people get out of their cars onto buses uh, if they were reliable and frequent enough? Yes, I think um, there would. Definitely. I mean, besides the companies helping helping them to, to 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 finance or purchase the subscriptions, of course, if they rely on connections actually working, maybe buses waiting for each other, some kind of agreements um, that they know they will get home on time or they will get to work on time. I think that's that's definitely crucial. And I have to say, um, the availability of data is very very. I mean, of course. I agree it's a new petrol more or less, but for us it is it is very important and we realize how often um, it just stops at the border. So we are trying to set it up and we're talking to one University of Applied Sciences in Aachen um, in order to set up a database of commuters actually um, to see what is the demand and what are the reasons for choosing to use the private car because we definitely still have a lack of information. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Paolo, could I just come back to you, if I may, um, about because uh, one of the issues that was raised was the question of uh, public service obligations for um, um, bus operators. Uh, is, is that uh, is that possible? Uh, can you ask bus operators to have public service obligations that extend over borders into other jurisdictions? Uh, this is a front runner question. I mean, this is uh, it's uh, it's one of the challenges we are currently facing. Uh, the regulation uh, 1370 allows uh, public authorities to um, to promote cross border connections uh, by, by public transport, and in particular, the interpretative guidelines allow uh, authorities to co-finance the same. Uh, service across the borders, in part uh, in, uh, in the next in the state and in, in the part uh, from in the other state. Therefore, there is the possibility, but uh, it is a bit complex to be put uh, to put in practice. Well, thank you very much, and thanks. But 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 at least it's it's very much a a, a discussion that is a live discussion. That is an important one. Um, I'm very grateful to all of our panelists. I'm afraid time is somewhat against us. I didn't want to conclude, though, without giving um, Marlies you an opportunity to reflect on any points that have arisen on which you wish to comment. Marlies, would you want to add anything? Uh, no, I want to thank you all for the for the for showing that there is uh, that there are solutions, but work is uh, yeah, it's hard work. We saw the ex examples where there's a, a whole history, uh, yeah, bottom up uh, to come to overcome obstacles and to to see solutions on the ground. So uh, and and like I said in the beginning, there are we have instruments at EU level also to to help and 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 also push for solutions. So I would uh, yeah, thank you all and. Uh, Alice, thank Let's you use much uh, the cross-border transport solutions that are in place. Thank you very much. I think it's been very interesting and uh, I think we should, um, as our uh, participants uh, particularly strongly uh, emphasise to us, working with the operators to deliver reliability and frequency is absolutely central to this. So it is a, it is a tough call because sometimes the economics of uh, putting in place services 
and uh, realizing uh, the that the uh, access to these services is quite hard to do um, but uh, clearly uh, i think hannah if i may presume to say what you demonstrated in your presentation has been achieved in the aachen region is an inspiration i think for for mm -hmm. many combination of governance and projects and the use of uh, all of the available solutions including the funding solutions i think really is uh, shows a great deal of what can be achieved uh, and uh, but all of our speakers have given us uh, i think really useful information for those who are wanting to achieve more in uh, moving uh, commuting and frequent traveling uh, onto public transport options so thank you very much for this fascinating debate this morning grateful to all of our speakers uh, and grateful to all of our participants for their um, questions and indeed responses to the poll. Uh, do have a very good day. Uh, enjoy uh, the sunshine. I hope if you have the sunshine, Paolo clearly has the sunshine behind him. Uh, but we <laughs> expect nothing less from Italy. Uh, so thank you all very much indeed for being with us. Thank you for joining. We will see you. Uh, do continue the debate on the Futurium, as you know. Uh, and uh, we will be and keep in touch uh, uh, keep an eye on the website. We're looking forward to a further border, beyond borders breakfast debate in the early autumn. Please look out for that. Thank you all very much indeed for being with us this morning.